So now we're going to turn our attention to strategies for reading that help create strong illness scripts. Remember, our expert, Dr. George Bordage, told us that improving your clinical problem-solving skills and developing sophisticated skills is not just about pouring more facts into your brain. It's about putting them into your brain in a way that's logical and organized and that facilitates accessing that information in the midst of a clinical encounter with a patient. So how do we build those illness scripts? Well, a good disease illness script is constructed by focusing predominantly and foremost on those features that allow you to differentiate that disease from other diseases that might present similarly or have similar symptoms, uh, like our case with Mr. Leader, the man with pharyngitis. We know that there are three, at least, diseases that might cause sore throat in a 15-year-old. One would be strep throat, another would be mononucleosis, and a distant third might be acute retroviral infection. So we want to focus, as we learn about each of those three diseases, on important features that will allow us to differentiate between those diseases when we're considering them in a patient with sore throat. Now, in reality, reading to build illness scripts may occur subconsciously, and in fact, in many experts, does occur subconsciously, but we can also facilitate the formation and accuracy of illness scripts if we pay attention to the way in which we encourage you how to read. So we also know some other things about learning that makes a structured approach to reading very logical and helpful. We know that in the absence of a memory framework relevant to the information at hand, it's very difficult to learn and store that new information. Many of you have had the experience of spending 20 or 30 minutes diligently reading a textbook chapter, only at the end to come up short when you're asked what was the most important facts or figures in that chapter. That's largely because you had no way of really understanding, without context and experience, what were the most important facts and figures. Now, novices, beginner medical students and interns and residents who are trying to learn a lot of information very quickly, frequently just put their shoulder to the wheel and try and memorize all important facts without prioritizing those that really have distinguishing um, possibilities. This is a lot like trying to fill a bucket with water. Eventually, as you keep pouring water in, water's gonna spill out over the edge. And what may spill out in our memory are important facts that should have stuck for us to truly understand a disease and how it compares to similar diseases. Some authors have described that this leads to what's known as the jaundiced textbook syndrome, a textbook that's been highlighted every single line as equally important. And of course, that makes it not relevant at all in terms of identifying the most important facts and figures. Now, this type of reading, uh, reading to memorize all facts, usually is the result of what we call a horizontal reading assignment. It's driven by a need to learn about a disease or condition. Many of us remember our clinical time on the wards. The attending would say, Mrs. Smith has lupus. Go home and read about lupus and tell us about lupus tomorrow. It focuses on a particular disease or concept in isolation and really requires memorization or at least stimulates memorization without helping the individual understand the framework in which that disease should be considered. So for example, if I am on the wards and I tell my medical student, Mr. Jones has good pasture syndrome, go home and read about good pasture syndrome, Typically, that medical student will take a textbook off the shelf or perhaps a review article, and they'll read horizontally, meaning they'll read about the mechanism of disease, the epidemiology of disease, the time course of which this disease presents, classic signs and symptoms, what diagnostic tests might be useful, and then what treatment options might be possible if, in fact, it turns out that Mr. Jones does, in fact, have good pasture syndrome. Now, those of you who are paying attention recognize that these elements we talked about here are our core components of illness scripts. So we do want to learn about this, but we don't want to learn about it in isolation, just for good pasture syndrome, without consideration of how other diseases might look like good pasture syndrome, but be something different. A better reading strategy, other than horizontal reading, has three goals. Goal number one, is it's important to build knowledge stores that emphasize compare and contrast learning about diseases. We call that comparison between diseases. Goal number two 
is embed that new knowledge in your brain in a way that makes it accessible in the clinical environment. This exploits Dr. Bordage's concepts about knowledge organization being as important as knowledge acquisition. We want those factual illness scripts to be triggered by a patient presentation rather than the way in which a textbook is organized. And the final goal is that reading should be active. You should be reading to seek information out to answer questions in your mind rather than just uh, enmesh yourself or in the information that's being presented to you. We've developed a strategy called clinical presentation reading, and I want to acknowledge the work of Bud Williams, or Frederick Williams, in doing this. It builds on the work of Mandan and the University of Calgary clinical presentations curriculum, and that reference is noted here. At the University of Calgary, they articulated wisely the observation that the human body has a finite number of ways to respond to derangements in core biomedical functions, regardless of the disease that causes them. And these responses are known as syndromes. And they're not limitless, they're finite. Somewhere less than 200 can articulate for you the ways in which diseases can present. So we're going to exploit this observation by encouraging people to read vertically rather than reading horizontally. And we do so using syndrome-driven clinical presentation diagnostic triads. Let's talk about what that means. First off, it's syndrome-driven. We want to take one of those common syndromes, in this example, hemoptysis, or the entity of coughing up blood, and we're going to identify at least three diseases that might present with that syndrome of hemoptysis. And for today's exercises, we've chosen lung cancer, good pasture syndrome, and granulomatosis with polyangiitis. Now, there are many other reasons that people present with hemoptysis, but we're going to focus on these for the sake of illustrating a way to read to build functional illness scripts. And our goal is to create that framework for the illness script and build those illness scripts with the most important facts, facts in this set of diseases that allow us to distinguish between good pasture syndrome, granulomatosis with polyangiitis, and lung cancer. Now, recall what I said earlier about horizontal reading assignments. In the traditional medical reading environment, I would have said to my intern or resident, go home and read about good pasture syndrome, and they'd read about good pasture syndrome. Then perhaps they'd read about granulomatosis with polyangiitis. I'm going to assign reading differently. I'm going to assign reading vertically. I'm going to say, go home and read about the mechanism of, lung cancer, of hemoptysis and lung cancer in contrast or comparison to the mechanism of hemoptysis in good pasture syndrome, and in contrast or comparison to the mechanism of hemoptysis for granulomatosis with angiitis. And then I'm going to ask them to do the same thing for each set of elements of the illness script. And it's that compare and contrast that is going to build the framework that we need to help store the facts as people read through the textbooks of medicine. Now it's also going to help to identify the key and differentiating features that should be a core element of these disease illness scripts. Now remember, a differentiating feature is within a given, within a given clinical presentation diagnostic triad, a feature that can be found in two out of three conditions, but not in the third. So for example, in this diagnostic triad, both good pasture syndrome and granulomatosis with polyangiitis present with glomerulonephritis or hematuria, but lung cancer doesn't. So in this situation, hematuria would be one of the differentiating features that you want to include in your illness scripts for granulomatosis with polyangiitis and good pasture syndrome. Key features are those features in this diagnostic triad that are only found in one of the conditions and not the other. So for example, um, lung cancer might have a key feature of epidemiology and that is a strong smoking history. Not present in all lung cancer, but it's not a common feature of good pastures or granulomatosis with polyangiitis. 
And good pastures might have massive hemoptysis, um, which is not usually seen in lung cancer or granulomatosis with polyangiitis. So as you read, we ask people, in fact, to complete this type of a chart, complete a compare and contrast chart, entering into each of the squares, either a key or a differentiating feature. What's important is that you shouldn't put something in each of these squares unless it truly represents a key or a differentiating feature. And you also don't want to just write so small that you can actually fit tons of information. What's more important here than quantity of facts is the quality of the facts ability to help you distinguish between any of these diseases within this given syndrome. Now, a couple of important points as we think about using these diagnostic triads and vertical reading strategies. Three is a random number. It's chosen for a convenient focus. If you like four, you can use four. If you like five, you can use five. But once you get beyond four, it begins to be hard to identify really those key and differentiating features. And you're better off having group, multiple groupings of three than expanding your list to, um, to a too lengthy list. The second thing that you'll realize very um, quickly as you begin to read is that the same disease can be in a triad for another syndrome, right? Um, so for example, good pasture syndrome and granulomatosis with polyangiitis could also be present in a diagnostic triad for the syndrome of hematuria or for glomerulonephritis. And lung cancer could be in a diagnostic triad for shortness of breath or chest pain um, or a significant weight loss. What's most important is, regardless of the syndrome that your patient is presenting with, always read about at least three diseases that could cause that syndrome and read about them in the same sitting to be able to facilitate those compare and contrast neural network connections. And the third thing I want to emphasize is that the organ organizing syndromes can be either clinically based hemoptysis or hematuria, or lab-based. So for instance, you can do a compare and contrast diagnostic triad for the non-GAP um, acidoses, just like you might be able to do a compare and contrast triad for anemias um, or for liver function abnormalities. So we're at the end of week one, and I just want to summarize briefly the key points from week one. First, Experts store knowledge in illness scripts. This is a different cognitive structure than novices use, and it's a structure that many develop on their own, but that we can facilitate the development of through accurate reading and thoughtful use of frameworks. Number two, illness scripts exist and are effective because they facilitate the use of information in the clinical environment. Number three, all illness scripts have a common structure, although the details within those illness scripts may vary among different clinicians. And by now, you should know that common structure. It includes an epidemiologic statement, a statement about the way in which the disease presents with regard to time, a statement about the classic signs and symptoms uh, present in that disease, and finally, a comment about the mechanisms that cause that disease. Number four, constructing accurate illness scripts requires an ability to understand how different diseases might present with the same syndromes. And this results in an ability to compare and contrast among features of different diseases. Finally, reading in the clinical presentation syndrome diagnostic triad format may facilitate the development of important illness scripts and might be a useful tool for you to adopt as you work through the rest of this course. Thanks for joining us for this week. Um, I want to turn your attention to the homework, which will be posted on the web, and encourage you to join us again for the next module, which will begin with a brief review of what we've accomplished this week, and then we'll continue on with helping you understand how people activate these illness scripts and strategies they use to make good clinical diagnoses when confronted with the signs and symptoms and concerns of their patients. We hope you enjoyed the week and look forward to seeing you again next week. Thank you.